This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 802, recorded on Wednesday, December 2nd, 2020. I saw mommy vaccinating Santa Claus. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on This Week in Science, we will fill your head with folding, wiping, and democracy for <clears throat> animals. But first, thanks to the Burroughs Welcome Fund and our Patreon sponsors for their generous support of Twist. You can become a part of the Patreon community at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. With all the threats on the global stage these days, it is time that we turn to science for solutions. But what is science? Some people say lots of things that aren't worth two cents. So we'll ignore what some people say for the moment and see what scientists have said about science. Because according to Galileo, science is something in which the authority of a thousand is not worth the humble reasoning of a single individual. The good thing about it, says Neil deGrasse Tyson, is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. Science is nothing more than a refinement of everyday thinking, says Albert Einstein. And science is a way of thinking much more than it is a body of knowledge, says Carl Sagan. Science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom, says Isaac Asimov. Okay, that last one isn't a science, but he's spot on considering how little wisdom is used in concert with science these days. And these days, the words of Marie Curie may be the most prescient of all. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. So we invite you to do just that with us. Understand more and fear less here on This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. And good science to you too, Blair. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again. Justin should be joining us if he can. He's having some technical difficulties and will hopefully be with us soon. But let us get this show on the road. So much science. There's so much good stuff to talk about this week. I have stories about predicting protein folding, plant memory wipes, and some biological freshness, the fresh mega. What did you bring, Justin? I've got asteroid smashing, uh, flooding the future with more floods. Oh, geez. Uh, wh what's uh, killing killer whales? And uh, solar crystals. Ooh, we can get new agey, huh? Crystals, huh? Crystals. Mm -hmm. Which crystal kills COVID? <laughs> <laughs> not, none of them. No? Uh, really? No. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> What's in the animal corner, Blair? Uh, smelly corals. I have flying crabs. Flying and, crabs. And uh, democratic vulture guinea fowl. Wait, what? <laughs> just birds just birds in Africa that eat dead stuff. Don't worry about it. We'll talk about uh, it later. Okay. But democratic birds is fine. Democ Bird, avian democracy. Even yeah. the birds can do it. Perhaps better than us. Stay tuned. I was going to say <laughs> something like that, but I was biting my tongue with it. You heard that heavy pause. That was a physical well, tongue biting. You'll have to hear the science to choose for yourself. Yeah. But let's jump into the show. I want to remind you that subscribing to Twists is pretty easy. Head over to your favorite podcasting platform and look for This Week in Science. We are most likely there. We're also on Facebook, YouTube, and now on Twitch at Twist Science. But you look for This Week in Science pretty much anywhere and you will find us. You can also head over to twist.org to find information about the show. All right, let's dive into the science now. I want to talk about protein folding. Mm. Yes. This week, a big announcement came out of Google. Go Google's? Google. No, Google. <laughs> Google's deep 
mind <laughs> AI endeavor, their AI software Alpha Fold just pretty much won the pack. It got best of show at a biennial event called uh, CASP. It's short for Critical Assessment of Structure Prediction. It's a protein structure prediction challenge that has been held for uh, several years now. And over the years, all of the AI programs that have been involved in and, and entered into the challenge trying to develop programs that can use artificial intelligence to be able to predict the structures of proteins have they've all worked at like 40 50 percent accuracy which is as as good as chance it's like as good or less good than guessing they haven't really been that great and then last year alpha fold started pulling ahead of the pack and this and this year in the challenge they hit 90 percent accuracy which is the threshold for really accurate protein structure prediction. And this is something that folding at home has been, has used. We've talked for years about fold it. Folding at home uses distributed processing power from people's computers to run all of the possible off all of the possible structures that pro, proteins could have to see which which ones work. Whereas fold it uses human pattern recognition to be able to determine the structures of these proteins. Essentially, what the artificial intelligence alpha fold does is it's machine learning. It's been trained on basic structures and things that are known to work. Uh, so you have a certain amino acid sequence. We know that it turns into this conformation in this situation, another, a different con conformation in a, in a slightly different si situation. Um, and putting it all together, they were able to really boost using machine learning as their uh, strategy to get to a point where the algorithms are doing as as good as folding at home, as good as human pattern recognition, but doing it faster. So instead of years, months to years to determine protein structures, it's a matter of days. So it's very exciting. This isn't something that's going to be like every lab is going to have it and AlphaFold is going to determine all the protein structures tomorrow. This is something that is a technological step forward. It has a lot of potential to change the direction of biotechnology, drug manufacturing, drug uh, identification, either even synthetic biology. It has a real potential to to affect medicine and therapies moving forward, but it's still going to take some time to get there. But it's a huge, huge advancement and I think very exciting. It reminds me of how uh, to crack a genome used to take years and a building full of computers and now it's something that can be done pretty much in any lab with a very yeah. simple computer so it's definitely yeah i see kind of similar uh, shadows of that here that this is something that could in in not a terribly long amount of time that technology could potentially be mm, streamlined and distributed yeah it could be very streamlined i mean for it to speed up detection and delivery i mean it just yeah it's I think it I think it's very exciting. It's we've come a long way, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Justin, do you want to talk about smashing asteroids? Smashing, darling. <clears throat> One Friday evening, 1992, a football sized meteorite weighing about 30 pounds made 150 mil or ended its 150 million mile journey in the trunk of a Chevy Malibu. In Peekskill, New York, which is about 50 miles north of New York City. In that sleepy little town, this came from far, far, far away in space and smashed this poor person's car. Now, 30 years later, that car has toured the world, uh, along with the meteorite that, that was in it. And they've taken a new look. This is a new analysis of that same meteorite, as well as 17 others by researchers at University of Texas, Austin. University of Tennessee, Knoxville as well. Uh, they got now a new hypothesis on how the asteroids formed in the, the early universe. Or not the early universe, early solar system, sorry. So previously it is thought that the meteorites were, or the, these asteroids were all very hot. And then they cooled, 
with this sort of layered cooling going in and in and in. Uh, and that was based off of looking at the rates of cooling. And those studies then they were only capable of measuring cooling rates from temperatures around uh, 500 degrees Celsius uh, and down. This is Nick Daggert, who is an assistant professor at University of Tennessee. He realized that this me- there's a method that they have there that they were using called rare earth element into prioxine thermometer. And he decided to apply it to space rocks. Now, the nice thing about this system is that it could do up to 1400 degrees Celsius cooling and down. And what they found then was that not all of these uh, fragments have cooled at the same rate. They found so from 900 degrees Celsius down to 500, the cooling rates were a thousand to a million times faster than they cooled at the lower temperatures. So this is, and these are, you know, we're finding, we're finding these are fragments from, from all these different asteroids or meteorites that have, that have landed on the earth that have these sort of drastically different cooling uh, times over this, over these two periods. What would make something cool at a thousand million times faster uh, at the, at, uh, at the higher temperatures than at the lower temperatures? And the only way they've been able to make sense of it is if we started with a bunch of big asteroids that just kept smashing into each other and breaking apart and then recollecting. Because it turns out once they recollect, even though those smaller ones will cool faster, once they then are recombined again, they slow down their cooling because they sort of create a blanket with lots of little uh, air pockets and, and it just creates a sort of porous asteroid in the very beginning, which actually tremendously slows down the the new recombined asteroid's ability to cool down. So instead of having sort of a peaceful uh, early solar system where stuff was just hot and then slowly cooled down and then occasionally broke apart, what we're finding is that everything was very, very hot and smashing into each other, breaking all apart and then coming back together and breaking apart and coming back together again. So... Uh, new insights into how our early solar system formed. It was very violent. Yeah, it sounds like it was like, yeah, super dynamic. There was a lot going on. And I love that it comes from the this just looking at it's like, oh, there's this weird discrepancy. Like these temperature, this why did it cool down differently? Because it doesn't make any sense. And that's where that's where the science questioning happens. And it's the how. Try to explain it. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, and also, you know, just the, being able to, uh, to see that cooling at the, what, what the cooling took place at those higher temperature ranges with new instrumentation applied uh, gave them the rest of the data that they were, they were missing in the first go-round. Very, very cool. So much data. Keep looking for it. Blair, mm, tell me about those coral reefs. How they doing? Are you, are you, are you? They're doing okay. <laughs> what was that? Uh, this is a study for the Did University you just of Technology. Do a line of coral? Sydney. What, what happened? No, I'm talking about how corals smell. Do you know how corals smell? Not how they physically smell, but how do they, how do they smell? They don't have noses. Oh. No, not how do they smell. How do they smell? Like, do they like, smell like hamburgers? They probably they smell, smell like, like seaweed. Do they smell like seaweed? That's a good question. Uh, Well, we know that every organism releases a distinct mix of volatile gases that makes up their smell. And a new study tells us that the smell of coral can actually tell us quite a bit about their health. Um, So you can tell based on smell, based on the... uh, the gases that are being released by an organism, how they cope with stress, and uh, and also later how those same gases, those self same gases, can influence atmospheric processes. If you're talking about coral, right? And so this is, of course, the first study to over, to study the smell of coral <laughs> and whether it varies from when they're healthy to when they're stressed. And they looked all over the southern Great Barrier Reef, and they looked at the abundance and um, and the diversity of gas emissions, and the the diversity actually fell significantly during heat stress. So 
I don't know if that means that they they were less smelly in general, probably, or if they were if there's a particular change in their smell. They're not telling us exactly about that, um, but they are telling us that the abundance and chemical diversity of the gases decreased with stress. Um, but so the the real sciencey stuff behind that is that the functional potential of the microbiome of the coral changes when they're stressed out. And that's really what this is about, is that they, that might impact their ability to cope with increasing temperatures. So there's signaling going on, potentially. So it's possible that corals are also releasing these smells to other organisms around them. It's possible it's affecting grazing fish possible it's affecting algae, it's possible it's affecting all sorts of things. Uh, but the next kind of step is to figure out really what is the smell of a coral that is vulnerable? Yeah. What's its smell when it's healthy? What's its yeah. smell when it's vulnerable? What's its smell when it is diseased? I mean, yeah. you can always tell when something's diseased, it smells like it's rotting, mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah. But stressed, and maybe that's something else. And then of course I can't else. help but wonder you know, do we give off a stress smell? I think that we do, right? We, mm -hmm. I think we've talked about that For in the sure. show that, that there's definitely, I mean, even last week we were talking about rats, right? There was, they would give off a smell that has to do with their, how they're feeling, if they're feeling supported or if they're, if they're feeling cooperative or all those sorts yeah. of things. So there's lots that goes into that, but um, yeah, how a coral smells, not only something you probably didn't wonder, how does coral smell, but also it's underwater. <laughs> so you probably don't think a lot about that for that reason either but it's no that's what i mean there have to be there's it's you're 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 just in a thicker fluid than air so there's mm -hmm. if you're a fish or if you're an organism you're still you're still swimming in that sea of odorants of of mm -hmm. of molecules that would smell if they came in contact with an organ yeah. for smelling I'm sure we could smell coral underwater if we wanted to. Just the problem is we drown first. Yeah. So yep. <laughs> that's don't... why it's kind of, it feels for it. <laughs> you a, can smell the roses, but don't yeah. smell the corals. Yeah. Yeah. You'll die. Yeah. Okay. You'll die. <laughs> oh, dear. Speaking of corals. Nope. Not speaking of corals. Let's talk about plants. Mm. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh from the University of Warwick, we have researchers who are uh, who are looking at plant reproduction and looking at proteins that are involved in how plants reproduce and the memories that they hold on to. And we've talked before about this idea of plant memory that some experiences during a plant's life do get do change the genome of the plant through epigenetic manipulations. And so there are proteins that are involved in these epigenetic manipulations, the histones and the methyl groups that get added to the, the genome. And when they get added, they reduce the adaptive potential of that genome, but they make it possible for the plant who has experienced a certain situation stressful, cold, lack of water, potentially, that maybe that plant can survive a little bit better because it's created these epigenetic adaptations to allow it to survive better. However, when it passes those adaptations on, if they get passed on to the offspring and the offspring hold on to them, then they can reduce the adaptability of the offspring because, like I said, they're limiting the way that the, the, the DNA can be used. Be, and so these researchers found out that there are a couple of protein molecules that are, they specific, specifically looked at Arabidopsis, which is a model, or model plant in the plant biology world. They looked at a couple of proteins, histone demethylases, demethylases. That's taking methyl, that's an enzyme that takes methyl groups away. So what these proteins do is they wipe the memory of plants. During sexual reproduction, these proteins become active and get rid of the epigenetic markers that were produced in the parent generation so that the offspring have a clean slate. 
and they can have all the adaptability to situations that they need. And this may explain why sometimes we do see memory getting passed down from generation to generation through these epigenetic genetic controls, because sometimes the demethylases don't work properly, and but sometimes they do. And so these memories don't get passed on all the time. I don't know. It's another interesting aspect of plant reproduction, and it probably has a, a pretty big impact on mutations that potentially occur and uh, the genome as it evolves down multiple generations. When we think about how how things go from experience into being genetic instinct, you're basically changing the adaptive potential of the genome. So anyway, plants, this is an e-life. It's a, an open access journal. And uh, yes, yes, plants, they have a memory wiping device in their genome. Want to talk about the water, Justin? I don't want any more water. But yeah. Uh, how high is the water, mama? Four feet high and rising. It actually probably could even be more than that. So uh, Superstorm Sandy, if we recall, that was back uh, a while ago, hit New York region, uh, causing an estimated 74.1 billion with a B Dollars with a D in damages. It was the fourth costliest uh, hurricane uh, behind Katrina and Harvey and Maria, which were both in 17. Uh, Katrina in 2005. So this is uh, researchers at Stevens Institute of Technology, and they found that the 100-year and 500-year flood levels could become regular occurrences. For the tens of thousands of homes surrounding Jamaica Bay, New York, by the end of the century. Although I kind of assume at that point, most of those uh, people who are living in that part of New York will be Midwesterners <laughs> by the end of the century because they'll just get sick of the flooding. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Or will have evolved gills and become. Murky. I don't think that's going to happen that quickly. I think people will move first. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Technology, you know. I mean, if they keep trying to build about... corals, maybe they'll figure it out. <laughs> you know, a hundred years from now, a hundred years to go ago, we didn't have like the car or the television yet. You know, a hundred years is going to be quite, quite amazing. We might get to mer people. This is a study was led by Riza Marsuli, <laughs> who is the assistant professor of civil, environmental and ocean engineering at Stevens Institute. And Somebody whose name you want to use both first and last every time. Reza Marsuli. That's a great name. But he's, he's been looking at the extent of how coastal flooding will increase in the future across the New York region. And therefore, you can also tr use his modeling system for other regions because it's basically the modeling system that they have built here. Uh, this is quoting Reza Marsuli. While this study was specific to Jamaica Bay, it shows how drastic and costly of an impact that climate change will make. Uh, they have published this in the uh, November 26th issue of climate change, or Climactic Change. The framework we used for this study can be replicated to demonstrate how flooding in other regions will look by the end of the century to help them mitigate risk and best protect communities and assist in impacted areas. Marshall Lee and Lynn, who's Lynn? Lynn is a co-author, Ning Lin from Princeton University. They, they conduct these high-resolution simulations for different scenarios to find the probability of different flood levels being reached, assuming that emissions remain at the high level and do not get reversed. Uh, they studied how sea level rise and hurricane climatology change would impact the area uh, with storm surge, wave hazards, a little bit of the sea rise being involved. Marsuli and Lynn found that the historical 100-year flood level, that's that big flood that happens once every 100 years. Mm -hmm. So not shared by every generation. It might even skip a generation between the times when it comes, right? Yeah. By the, uh, found that <clears throat> would become a once every nine-year flood level. <laughs> Nine? <laughs> by mid-century. 2050. By 2050. By 2050. Nine years. Every nine. So once a once a decade. More than once a decade. It, yeah. it, it would over time be more than once a decade. Yes. Yeah. Near the end 
uh, of that century, starting around 2080 to 2100, it'll be a yearly event. Wow. It'll just be every year, the just weather. flood the weather. Just we just be... flood. <sighs> this is what we do here. <laughs> but but let me get this straight. Um, tackling climate change right now is too expensive. <laughs> mm hmm. But see, yeah. this is where the cognitive dissonance comes in because this is where this is where wisdom, they're not looking uh, at future just, costs. They're looking at well, it's just expensive now. Yeah, not this is future. where the accumulated knowledge and the wisdom of society don't match up. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So, but now Superstorm Sandy was not one of those once every hundred years. Superstorm Sandy was a once every five hundred yeah type event. By mid-century, that would be uh, what would only occur still once every 143 years. So, bah, we don't even need to think about that one. That's so far off into the future. <laughs> <clears throat> by, the, <laughs> by the end of the century, it'll be a once every four year. All right, 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 right. That is, that's rapid acceleration. That is, that is, that's crazy. Wow. The time to act is last week. <laughs> uh-huh. We are behind. We are just behind. So everybody, just know that at a certain, if you're in Jamaica Bay, other New Jersey, other areas, low-lying areas, Florida, Miami, you're going to have to move at some point, your, and your property is not going to be worth very much. <laughs> yeah. Science. Uh, yeah. This is, this is, this is when we're talking about Kevin Jones saying, "Buy the mountain, Justin." Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have to buy a mountain before too long. Uh, but this is uh, um, one of those. If we, c you know, I, I've got I've gotten a little flag in the, in the past saying we should stop rebuilding. I think Haiti. Uh, it's always going to have devastating strength earthquakes that take place there, and you can retrofit all the buildings and do that, but you're still going to have issues. It's uh, fault. Yeah. If you if you build next uh, a, a community next to an active volcano, you should expect that there's going to be a disaster. These are not mm -hmm. natural disasters at th th this point. Once we have the knowledge of what's going to occur in the future, and then you build and rebuild and reinvest and redo it again, these are man-made disasters at that point. Yeah. You are we can uh, avoid things like this if we if we plan appropriately, if we take a long view and and plan appropriately plan for 50 to 100 years from now and the every four year, 500 year floods. No, oh, humans, why are we so ridiculous? Seriously, we're so ridiculous. Uh, well, Justin likes to talk a lot about our bacteria and how that affects our brains and people like to talk about whether bacteria are involved in so many different things. A cool study out this week looked at bacteria and how it affects our vitamin D levels. Bacteria in our guts. Researchers from the University of San Diego, California, University of California, San Diego, there we go, looked at men in their 70s and 80s and their microbiome and levels of vitamin D. The vitamin D that is normally measured when they're measuring vitamin D is inactive vitamin D. It's just vitamin D. It's a precursor to vitamin D. It's not doing anything except really sitting in your bloodstream. They wanted to know about active vitamin D. Active vitamin D is actually hormonally active. It is going and doing things. It's going and it can interact with your bones, your blood, your skin, all these things. Uh, and we don't normally measure it. And they ended up looking at gut bacteria, different levels of these different vitamin D metabolites in the blood, and determined that we're looking at things, we've been looking at things in this really weird way. And first, not looking at active vitamin D may be completely could completely explain the discrepancies that we've seen in a lot of different studies about the effectiveness of vitamin D, that if it's just the precursor and not actually doing anything, then you could have high vitamin D levels and 
yes, it could be related to good health or not, because it's just the it's the precursor. It's not actively doing anything. However, they found that your gut microbiome is involved in metabolizing active vitamin D. And um and people with these men with certain microbiomes were found to have higher vitamin active vitamin D levels than uh than other individuals that didn't. And so what they think is going on is that the the gut microbiome can determine your active vitamin D level, and then that determines what is actually going and doing stuff in your body. So if you don't have the right gut microbiome, you may not be metabolizing and using, turning into active vitamin D, all of the the precursor vitamin D that you're taking in your supplements. And so you could have a lot of vitamin D in there, but your gut microbiome might not be helping out because you have the wrong gut microbiome, because your gut's not healthy. And so you may not be getting the benefits of that vitamin D. So then, so that means, uh, one, throw out all of the (laughs) nutritional studies having to do with vitamins. Uh, (laughs) Well, we know vitamins are kind of... (laughs) And, and, well, no, they might not be. So this is is what this is saying then, uh, is that actually those who, those who have shown to have incredible benefit from taking uh, xyz vitamin although there's i could have used like b c d i guess a b c d yeah it could be any of them yes right um but they actually work if you can convert them and if you can't Mm -hmm. then obviously they would have no effect right so so you have to throw out the the naysayer data as well as the positive data find the correlation with the micro uh, gut microbes and then you've got a probiotic vitamin pill you have to take, which is like mm-hmm. twice as big. But but, it, but yeah, that, um, that uh, absolutely makes sense. Yeah, It does. Yeah. And the researcher says it seems like no matter it doesn't matter how much vitamin D you get through sunlight or supplementation or how mm-hmm. your, much your body can store. It matters how well your body is able to metabolize that into active vitamin D. And maybe that's what clinical trials need to measure in order to get a more accurate picture of the vitamin's role in health. And a different researcher says, in this case, maybe it's not how much vitamin D you supplement with, but how you encourage your body to use it. And the bacteria involved specifically uh, produce, these beneficial bacteria produce butyrate, which is a beneficial fatty acid that helps maintain gut lining health. So it could be related to the gut lining. It could be related to the bacteria themselves. But if you've got bacteria that make butyrate you're probably doing what needs to be done to your vitamin d um how do we know how do we know the chicken and egg here because Mm -hmm. there's part of me that wonders like do we know these this particular type of bacteria is it something that's genetically linked is it something that is environmentally linked because the other thing i'm wondering is right don't know do you yeah. have more of this bacteria i'm just throwing it out there cuz you got more sun as a kid <laughs> right like is your body more <laughs> used be. to taking in vitamin d <laughs> and so you develop a microbiome that can handle it hmm. it's i I, yeah. I just i always question too when there's vitamin d related so, studies in california okay so let me this this actually i this is a very <laughs> important point from this study and i'm actually glad you asked this question they okay. looked at these men from across the united states they okay, had good. many of these individuals lived in san diego there were some who lived in new york city some who lived up in seattle there are six cities around the united states mm-hmm. and they were all in good health And so they just looked, they did uh, DNA, RNA sequencing to identify the bacteria in their stool. And then also they looked at the vitamin D metabolites. And so they were able to able to break it down. The men in uh, San Diego got the most sun and they also had the most precursor form of vitamin D, but they did not necessarily have Mm. the most active form of vitamin D. And that was based on that was bacterially linked. Interesting. So that yeah, so they were able to uh, take location and sun exposure into account. Good. Uh, however, 
not child. I don't know if they. I don't know if they did childhood sun exposure. Yeah, but. right. That's that's a whole other thing for sure. Yeah. yeah. And just before we go off into other topics that we love, I do want to take a moment to uh, to mourn Arecibo. Uh, I saw in our in our chat last week that um, who was it? Mike Shoemaker had said. Rest in peace, Arecibo. This week, Arecibo's observatory crashed to the ground. It was not an it was not a planned crash. It was not a planned destruction, but the radio observatory is no more, unfortunately. Um yeah. and we will see where where we go next with our radio astronomy and whether and this all the, happened from a bad yeah. cable. It, yeah. A cable broke. But it was that thing. happened because of a hurricane. Which yes. that it was <laughs> detailed oh. climate the change. Thing that, the thing that crashed has been like stuck hovering above this thing, uh, rather mm-hmm. unsecured, I guess, for this whole time. And then yeah. while they were doing, I guess they were going to repair it. They were like, "Ah, oh, it's no big deal. It's just panels and some metal and cable." And then the thing that was not secured a year later or so, however long it's been, collapsed and crashed. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a sad day for Puerto Rico and for astronomy in Puerto Rico and for astronomers around the world uh, who have made use of the Arecibo Observatory, iconic observatory, but um, there will be more science. We need radio observatories like Arecibo to, uh, to tell us about the space around our planet. There's so much we need to learn, especially which of those objects out there are going to come smacking into us. Arecibo is involved in identifying those. I would like to have more of that identification. So let's put money there. Uh, Let's do that. If you just tuned in, this is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you're interested in a Twist shirt or mug or other item of Twist merchandise, head over to twist.org and click on our Zazzle store link to browse the store. There are lots of items there for sharing and caring as the holidays come through. Also, on the website, we have our Twist calendar for 2021. So if you Mm -hmm. would like your 2021 Twist calendar with original artwork by Blair, make sure you Get your order in today. All right, time for the COVID update. Yeah, we actually have good news this week, right? Yeah, we do actually do 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 have good news. So I'm going to start off with the bad news and then go to the good news. Oh, sure. I thought it was just all good news. What happened? I got taken away quick. I didn't take anything away. There's always bad news with COVID. Just we're excited to have some good this week. Yes, we are. Researchers <laughs> published this week in Nature Neuroscience from the Charité Universitat Medizine Berlin on their research into how so- SARS-CoV-2 enters the brain through your Wait, nose. It enters the brain? Through your nose. Wait, this is is this just like the less bad news than the next story? Good news? Is this like going to be by comparison to the next story? The COVID yes, goes yes. into your brain? Well, we, we have known for a while that people lose that some people lose their sense of smell yes. when they are infected with COVID. Uh, some people, uh, things smell off or funny. Additional uh, people have neurological defects, will have memory loss or slowness or fogginess. Their brain, your brain just isn't quite right. And it's not just a result of fatigue from the disease. Researchers have suggested that SARS-CoV-2 is actually getting into the nerves of the brain. And for this First time, the researchers produced electron microscope images of intact coronavirus particles inside the olfactory mucosa, so in the lining of your nose, and additionally, they followed it through the olfactory nerves and into the brain. And they found SARS-CoV, they they found evidence of SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, um, the the majority of the SARS-CoV-2 viral particles were found in the the olfactory mucosa. So there's a, they get into the 
you inhale the virus, it gets into the cells of your mu- your mucous membrane. And Hang then- on the snot locker. That's right. And that's great. You want it to stay there. But unfortunately, yeah. if it's reproducing a lot there, infecting the cells and your your mucosa can only do so much. And after a while, it can't block the invader anymore. And they're able to move up the nerves of the nose into regions of the brain. They did tissue samples and cell samples for SARS-CoV-2 genetic material and spike protein. And they were able able to find, uh, they found evidence of the virus in the uh, abdullah, the, the medulla oblongata and the pons, the areas of the brain that are responsible for the control of breathing. What? Which is not, which is not good. That's another reason that the breathing becomes labored, doesn't beca- isn't as easy um, in extreme, what? yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bad virus. It's so, the so the, <laughs> virus. It's the, yeah, so like the immune response is creating lung mucus to begin with. It's a respiratory mm-hmm. disease yeah. to begin with. Mm-hmm. But in that, it's also t- somehow attracted to the brain center. Yes. Well, and it's also breathing? impacting like, your blood. So like it's it's impacting your blood's ability but, to move oxygen around. To, it's just, it's like, how's all the ways that I can suffocate you? Let's just tick yeah. them all off. It's yeah. not good. Yeah. It's no, yep, that so. doesn't sound. Uh, Gwarf Sharma has the same question I do. How do viruses travel through nerves? Are they just fit? <laughs> nerves are cells and if there is a receptor then they will uh the spike protein will will end up attaching to the receptor and binding to the receptor and gaining entry to the cell. The particles will take over the neural machinery because it has the same machinery for reprodu- reproducing DNA and RNA as other cells in the body. And so that machinery will be taken advantage of as well. And um, I think it also in the nerves, you have long distance transport mechanisms, which may help move the virus through the nerves along the uh, the axons and the dendrites they also terrifying. think okay, that you they also they also think nerves. that they also no. think that the blood ve- that blood vessels are involved and that uh so cerebrospinal fluid blood vessels um all involved in carrying the virus from the nose into your brain yeah so this is a good time to remind everyone to cover your nose with your mask <laughs> It's so another good, good reason to do that is to cover your nose. Yep. That would be a great okay. idea. You don't want your nose hanging out. Okay. I don't want to hear the next story. If that was the good news. Part. No, that wasn't the good news. The good news is now. <laughs> the good news is now. Absolutely. Moderna reached its phase three vaccine trial and uh, primary efficacy endpoints with 94.1% overall efficacy. It is reported it applied for U.S. FDA uh, emergency use authorization, and it expects expedited review of its data mid-December with the possibility of vaccines rolling out just before Christmas. By the 21st or 22nd, if the review goes well, it can be expected that Moderna vaccines will be available to frontline workers uh, right before Christmas. Wow, that's quick. So this is very, very good news. The uh, From a press release, not from a study, although Moderna does, uh, do, has stressed that they will be producing a peer-reviewed uh, study for the for people to to look at that they are going to go through that entire process um they say that they had 30,000 participants including 196 cases of covid-19 of which 30 cases were severe vaccine e- e- efficacy against covid-19 was 94.1% efficient efficacy against severe covid-19 was 100% so severe COVID-19 cases were only in the placebo group, not in the uh, vaccinated groups. Uh-huh. It continues to be generally well tolerated, no serious safety concerns to date, and it's exceeded two months of median follow-up post-vaccination as required for the emergency use authorization. They're expecting, expecting before Christmas, which is 
which is really, really quite exciting. They have uh, the 196 COVID-19 cases included 33 older adults, 42 participants identifying as being from diverse communities. Uh, and the so they've got a fairly they've got a, a broad group of people. The primary analysis from today was based on 196 cases, 185 of COVID-19 in the placebo group versus 11 in the vac- vaccinated group which is a not, significant difference. 30,000 people. It's not millions of people, but it's mm-hmm. thousands of people. And that's that's very exciting. So uh, it's yeah, very positive Some countries positive have more news. people than have gotten the virus. So <laughs> for, mm-hmm. for some communities, that's a, that's a great sample size. Yeah. Indeed. And in addition to this good news... Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, the the their mRNA vaccine is under expedite expedited review in the UK. So they are currently being reviewed and based on the outcome of that decision which could be any day now, distribution might start within the week. So the uh the UK may have a a vaccine in use within a week. So I I know I heard today on the news that um, that one, the Pfizer one in the UK is going to be someone asked um, how long they last and what the dose was like. That one's supposed to be a jab and then a jab 21 days later, Mm -hmm. Um, which, you know, I will just admit that's going to be more complicated to orchestrate. Um, Mm -hmm. All of them. Yeah. All of them are two doses. Yeah. Yeah. So all, a, all of them are two doses and is way yeah. harder to orchestrate. Yeah. Um, how do you make sure people come back and get their second dose? How do you how do you arrange for the scheduling behind it? It's just it's a lot. It's a lot to figure out. And luckily, that's what people are doing right now in the United States. I it was very it was very um, encouraging to hear. They were like, we're way past the how do we keep this cold face? We've got that figured out. What we're figuring out is who gets the vaccine when. And so yeah. that, I think, is the main thing that um, that people are focusing, the powers that be are focusing on for the next month or so until it's, it's allowed to go out. Yeah. Another big question is how long the antibodies, how long the immunity from these vaccines will last. And at this point, Based on the trials, oh, no. we don't know. We know that they <laughs> have followed their the, their their patients, the the people who have volunteered for the study, for two months. These va- these vaccine trials have not been going on very long. Uh, we have started to see results from studies looking following people from up to six months having after having had COVID itself and are showing at least six months worth of immunity. Mm-hmm to COVID in, in a lot of situations, most situations. So fingers crossed that yeah. the vaccines will give similar immunity if they work and if they the way don't. other vaccines do at least a year. Yeah. Once and a year they, you have to go. Uh, twice because you need to get the booster still. But right. the, yeah. the, 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 the thing is they don't really need to be any more than a six-month effective if we don't do a drunken, staggered walk of right. But that's the problem, yeah. No, I know. I mean, uh, so, but what we're going to have this round is the drunken stagger. Yeah. Right? So we are going to knock out people who can hopefully even catch and reproduce this uh, virus. And by doing that, we can then probably in the second year of, of doing this go, okay, this October. We're going to get everybody. If we figured out if it only has six months, we can still work around it. Just need to get everybody within the same month to take it so that those following months you have done essentially the same thing as just staying indoors for two months or six weeks or something. Right. Um, Because that's what you just need to do. You just need to get everybody to stop transmitting it to each other. We're the vector. It's this this virus isn't just going like I'm going to go down the street knock on this door go down the chimney <laughs> No it's waiting for you to go breathe there. on people It's not like blowing around in the <laughs> wind It's human vector humans mm-hmm. are transmitting humans are picking this up carrying it and giving it to other humans So aside from a full lockdown 
uh, this this vaccination of the people who are going to be out, and and I I have no doubt that there is going to be a first responder first wave of this. The second wave of the vaccine is the one that starts to get curious because our CEOs first responders are just wealthy people who are staying at home but want to go out <laughs> and shop. Like who's going yeah. to get the access to this? Uh, in the United States, because we don't have universal health care, we have a tiered system built into who has Pay what kind play. of insurance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yep. And and it's, it's what your state, ugly. it's also, it's not just your insurance, it's what your state is able to get from the federal government. The federal government has contracts with manufacturers. Those manufacturers are supplying certain amounts at certain times. They're going to make those lots available to the states, the states, states like California may are probably making their own deals mm -hmm. with manufacturers to mm -hmm. get their own. You know, if you have enough money, you can get they can get their own. And so states even are going to be uneven in that respect. And then from there, it goes to county level and how you actually start rolling it out at your pharmacies or at your doctor off doctor's office or is it only at hospitals where are these vaccines and how do you get them and yeah. it is a huge question right now of uh there's an article in stat right now by helen branswell that is stat news it's amazing it's uh all about the last mile and that you know we've talked about the last mile in cable and internet wires getting to the house before but this is the last mile or of access to banking loans yeah, but this is the last mile in getting the vaccines to people. And it's yeah, it's going to be it's going to be very interesting because most of us we're sitting here talking about it but we don't have a say in it. And uh you know, hopefully our our elected government government officials here in the United States are going to be doing the best planning possible to get it out to the people who need it first. I assume I am one of the last people who need it. I work at home. I don't, you know, I, I'm not a frontline work <laughs> worker. I, I, I'm not somebody who needs it right away. But Brian needs it. He's working yeah, well, in, an, in a, an emergency room. Maybe yeah. the spouses. This, yeah. Of, so this is part the of the thing I have not the heard. Then, right. How as part work? of the narrative is, yeah. what if, what if a person who works in the ER uh, lives with other people? is yes i understand he might not be able to get it but he might touch something in the hospital and then drive home and then touch me and then i can still get it so like just because you vaccinated that person doesn't it's mean a li it's a lower likelihood like, yeah it's yeah. definitely it's lower, lower likelihood definitely, but it's yeah. still you definitely tell him to wash his hands when he comes yeah, home. I'm mean, surprised <laughs> he's not doing that that's actually stunning but still it's, it's part <laughs> yeah. of the narrative i haven't heard right is the households of essential workers because right. i do think that's part of the conversation just because mm -hmm. like you know, there's also there are schools in session in a lot of the country right now. So if you have kids at home where there's an essential worker, then that is, a you know, there's but just then, there's but then you're the also, conversation. Though. But then you're also the essential workers are teachers because they are right. teaching the kids in the schools. The essential really? workers are bus drivers. The essential workers are at grocery stores. The essential workers, you know, there are so many levels of how this needs to roll out and there are not enough doses for the immediate future it's going to take time and we just have to know that it, it will happen with time if you want a vaccine you will eventually get one you just have to be careful until that happens that's so the, in the highlight meantime, yeah that's the highlight they are coming they're not here today yeah they will be here the news is positive in that direction so Wear your mask for that last mile, everyone. That's what that's what we gotta do. Let's we're in this for the marathon, everyone. And as Super Justin marathon. so uh eloquently put last week, and I think it's very important that we keep talking about it, is that a vaccine doesn't heal you if you get COVID. <laughs> no. Right? No. It prevents you from getting infected. So that is part of the narrative that I think is really, really important to keep hammering is it doesn't help you if you're sick. <laughs> so like you have to stay healthy until you get that jab. Stay healthy. Well, yeah, what would be hilarious is if everybody realized that this is the last mile and all stayed at home for the next like eight weeks 
Oh waiting for the, to get uh, the vaccine first. And mm-hmm. then it turns out we didn't need it because people just stayed home for two months. We could have, oh, by amazing. information level, May, we should have been done with this. Yeah. We should have been done with this by May and go, mm-hmm. hey, remember how the beginning of the year was terrible, but it got better? Yeah. Now everything's fine? Whew. That was, that was a big scare. <laughs> Boy. This is This Week in Science. Do you want to help us grow? We'd like to grow. We, like, we want more people in here to hear our rants and to hear our stories and to enjoy science. Tell a friend about Twist today. Let's get on back in here with a little section of the story. Of the story? No, of the show that I like to call Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair? Yeah. She loves our creatures. How did the insect get its wings? Do either of you know? Is this an Aesop fable? Not quite. Okay. Uh, But it could be. Uh, It's something that uh, has eluded scientists for very long is what is, where, where did the wings come from? What is the evolutionary origin of insect wings? Can I guess? Can I guess? Can I guess? Sure. Cooling mechanism? Okay, but what's the what's the source yeah, evolutionary? That would be kind of a why, it, evolutionarily, but where yeah, that's from? the why. Yeah. But yeah, oh, but where, where oh, did this structure come from? Oh, I have no idea. How? Right? What's just, the how? They were invertebrates. They didn't have wings, and then they had wings, and that's I, it. it right? Where did they come from? So uh, the the conventional wisdom for a really long time was that um, at about. 300 million years ago, whatever it was, um, it was a novel evolutionary item. And that is really, 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 really unusual. When you look at evolutionary history, you look at embryonic development, you look at the genetics, and you find something that it comes from, right? So like the our inner ear is based on a jawbone and fish, for example, right? So all these things have uh, genetic and evolutionary origins. So um, the insects kind of eluded scientists for a very long time. And then there is a new theory that was published this week in uh, Nature, Ecology, and Evolution. Um, It was a team from Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole. And they think they have settled the controversy. They looked at clues from long long ago scientific papers, super old scientific papers, and genomics. Because there's lots of scientists over the years that have had these crazy theories, and then uh, they have no way to prove it. So then it just sits there, they get laughed out of the the lecture hall, whatever it is. And then, you know, decades later, we do some genomic research, and we find out they were right all along. You know, tale as old as time in science. So um, the new theory here, or the old theory that has come to light, is that These insect wings actually evolved from an outgrowth or a lobe on the legs of crustaceans. Yes. So this is about 300 million years ago. Crusty legs turned into wings. Yes, exactly. Marine crustaceans transitioned to being land dwellers around 300 million years ago. The leg segments closest to their body became incorporated into their body wall. So part of their exoskeleton during embryonic development. This might have been to support its weight on land. Not sure why. But then the leg lobes moved up towards the insect's back and later formed the wings. Their legs. Their crab legs. So prior to now, prior until they, they, uh, 2010, they were able to look at the, the genomics, the genetics of insects and crustaceans and they figured out that they are more closely related to crustaceans oh geez dog fell off a thing never mind Um, (laughs) more closely related to crustaceans than to millipedes and centipedes which is what 
uh, the, the, again, the conventional wisdom was. It was just based on the way they looked. They were like, mm, they look like, more like millipedes than crabs. We'll say that insects are related to millipedes. But no, we have since found out they are related more closely to crabs. She's fine, if you're listening or watching. So, um, <laughs> anyway, this is how, in, before they were thought to be these novel structures, the wings. But um, when they were looking at old studies there was there was a paper in 1893 that said that insects had incorporated their proximal which means close to the body leg region into their body wall so this theory existed from 1893 then in the 1980s there was a reading there was a um, a theory that the proximal leg region in the body wall was incorporated, but the lobes on the leg later moved to the back and formed wings. So reading both of those things, then comparing genetic instructions from the segmented legs of a crustacean. Um, the crustacean they were looking at was the tiny beach hopper. And then looking at the segmented legs of insects, like the fruit fly, Drosophila. They actually looked at, they used CRISPR, Cas9, to edit their genome. They were able to disable the uh, shared leg patterning genes between these two and found that the genes corresponded to the leg segments farthest from the body wall. And th there was a seventh leg segment in the crustacean that they were able to track to the wings. So this was two historical theories that everyone kind of yeah. thought was bunk that later the gen the genetic data and embryonic data they looked at embryonic development of course proved those theories the genome is so forensic yes and it's yep. and its ability to uh uncover things that uh happened long ago amazing mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of one of the scientists uh, that worked on this said, one of the theories that is emerging from genomic comparisons is that nothing is brand new. Everything mm -hmm. came from somewhere. And you can, yeah. in fact, figure out from where. It started somewhere. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it's the phylogeny, right? There's that biological saying, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, which is to say that the development of an organism, um, it replays the evolution or the evolutionary path that that organism took. So, for instance, the fact that humans, we have gills in the womb, we have webbed, webbed feet and toes, and, uh, and now and then you end up being human without gills and without webbing between between your toes and uh, yes. unfortunately for those living in jamaica new york <laughs> yeah but it's in there the the instructions for for gills and uh you know this is chick uh, chickens with the potential to have teeth mm. and you know mm -hmm. these yeah these instructions that are they're mm -hmm. in there somewhere and i at some point there is a novel mutation at some point in the phylogeny that leads to a branch, that leads to a new trait, that leads to something different, but it did start somewhere and you can mm -hmm. track it back. Really? Yeah. So there you go. Insect wings. That's where they came from. Crabs. Crab legs. <laughs> Huge story. Yeah. <laughs> Insect yeah. wings. They came from crabs. They sure did. Um, so next, it. I'm going to move from crab, crab wings to uh, guinea fowl democracy. Um, so moving on up. Yeah, this is a study from Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior and the Cluster of Excellence Center from the Advanced Study of Collective Behavior at the University of Constance. Yeah. It's a mouthful. They study the links between dominance and group decision making in wild vulturine guinea fowl. So a guinea fowl basically looks like an African chicken. They're native to the savannas of East Africa. The vulturine guinea fowls, you might imagine, have a big um, bald head and they eat carrion. So they look like vultures with dark colored chicken bodies. You're welcome. Go Google it if you really want to know. They're pretty they're cute. Yeah, they're cute. So 
anywho, um, they wanted to study these guys because they are, you know, here we go, the first bird species. So I'm sure there's others like this, but they're the first bird species to have been reported to live in a multi-level society where social groups um, have preferential interaction with other social groups. They can be in groups of 15 to 60 individuals. And within these large groups, there's a clear dominance. So not only is there a social hierarchy, the way social groups interact within this group, but on top of that, there is a dominance. So like wolves and primates, there is an alpha or a group of alphas. There's a group of dominant members that can outcompete other group members and exclude them from food. So they get preferential treatment, basically, because they, they're they bullies, essentially. It's so, mine. Yeah. So the question is, um, how does this work with the fact that you also see them doing things that equates to what you might call voting? Now, bear with me. <laughs> there are groups of animals that have equal say in certain things and they quote unquote vote with their feet. So basically whoever moves, whichever direction the most of them move in, that's the way the rest of the group has to follow. It reminds me of kind of schooling fish, right? But that's because um, for example, these birds have bright plumage, they stick out. And so if they're, if they're by themselves, they're going to be eaten. But if they're in a big group, they're probably gonna be left alone. Uh, vulturine animals have like very nasty beaks. So um, they're, they're not to be trifled with if they're in large groups. So if the majority of the group is moving one way, it behooves the rest of the group to follow. To do it, yeah. Right. So this is part of this kind of voting element. So the weird thing is these vulturine guinea fowls do both. They have dominant individuals and they also have been shown to vote with their feet. Hmm. <laughs> So how do these two blend is really what this is about. And in this study, they were able to um, observe them on foot, do video tracking, do high resolution GPS. They looked across multiple groups of these guys spanning several years. And they were able to record disputes between individuals and then assign rank based on who won. Then they used an evaluation procedure just like you would do for um, chess, football, table tennis, any sort of playoff scenario where you can do comparative rankings. So you can figure out based on who won and lost to whom, who's ranked highest, who's ranked lowest and all everything in between. So um, they also then monitored which bird initiated departures from and to new feeding sites. So who started the movement away from a space or towards a space and the order of individuals following them from first to last. This is a lot of data. But what they found was that who initiated and often therefore decided where the group moved to next was dependent on actions of the dominant group members. But that doesn't mean it was the dominant group members who made those decisions. Mm. It means that was influenced by the actions of the dominant group members before that. So when groups are feeding in large areas and um, food was distributed accessibly to everyone, everyone, then all of the group members contribute equally to where they were going next. But when dominant individuals basically were jerks and monopolized a particularly <laughs> rich food patch, didn't it's let fine. other people eat it, chasing other groups out, people, fowl, guinea fowl, fowl. then um, fowl, the excluded the subordinates list. combined their votes to move the group away from the patch. So basically like, oh, you're going to be a jerk about this food? Okay, great. We're all going to leave then and you can't eat at all. <laughs> So they ended up having to abandon the rich resources that they were able to kind of hoard in that previous interaction. So this suggests that democratic decision making, as opposed to despotic leadership, evolved so that group members could obtain resources that they needed to survive despite their ranking. So this is the story of America. Everyone has a voice. This is the story of America. This is the, this is how America got its start. There were resource hoarders back in England. Yeah. And mm -hmm. America was like, America, uh, people who became Americans, and she were like, you know what? Let's go to a, let's just leave. <laughs> let's just leave we need, them. We need to find a different food patch. Yeah. And go to a but place if, but where if, we but can. But if this, if this was like that, then the king would have followed. 
That's what the difference is. Yeah. Well, they, right. he, by the way, they, he tried. <laughs> he, he did try. He did try. Yeah. So I think that's the difference here. But also, I would say if you want to draw a human comparison, this is an important thing for us to remember now. Because we find ourselves now once again with a very small number of people with a lot of resources. Right. And there is an understanding that, well, what are you going to do? They have the resources. But here is proof right here that the people who have less resources actually have a lot of power. Because if you take the group away from that individual with all the resources, they're not as well off. So yep. that's kind of my like moral out of this. If you want to turn it into an Aesop fable, like the last story was kind of like an Aesop fable. Now it's like the vulturine guinea fowl and the power of democracy. Is this Aesop fable? <laughs> or even, well, yeah, or even into uh, capitalism. So for instance, mm -hmm. people who are asking others not to shop with Amazon, you know, if eventually they get enough people to go along with it, then Amazon will uh, maybe change some of its employment and uh, climate change practices. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, right? the thing I was I mean, it's is just, like, it's like, how does it, it, it kind of works that way. So you have you to get, be you reminded gonna, that you swell. have the power, I you think is what's power. really important here. So yes. the, uh, the last important. couple of quotes I'll leave you with from this story says, by being able to initiate and make the group move away from monopolized resources, democratic decision-making allows subordinates to take back control when too much power is lost to dominance. So one of the lead researchers, Danai Papa Georgiou, which is a doctor researcher at the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior and the leading researcher of this study, says, quote, our findings highlight how collectives can react to rising social inequity. Democratic decision-making is critical for maintaining a balance of power in societies where functioning as a group is critical to survival. Right. And yeah. so to have that, you need first the democracy. Uh, and then the migration can be to policies that uh, favor the group over the select few individuals. You can, you can politically migrate. Uh, to do that, you don't have to go to the moon from uh, or find find a new patch of right. <laughs> of dirt and I believe point. there, I believe there are some some pretty good lines out of uh, Monty Python's Holy Grail that um, have yes relation to this as well. <laughs> Help! I'm being oppressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know which scene I'm talking about. Yes, I, I sure do. Oh, I love it. Oh, that's fun. Democratic birds. They can teach us so mm. much about ourselves. These birds, these animals. Really, it's all connected, isn't it? Mm. It is. Thank you for listening to Twists. If you are watching right now, thank you so much for being here. If you're listening right now, thank you for putting us into your ears. We love getting into your brains and warming our ways in with information to be able to build your curiosity and hopefully get you to ask questions and learn more about the world that we share together. If you like listening to or watching Twists, please consider supporting us on Patreon. You can head to twist.org, click on the Patreon link, and select the level of your support. $10 and more per month will get you thanked by name at the end of the show. And a lot of the levels have neat goodies, many of which will be sent out very soon. Another way that you can support us right now is purchasing one of the 2021 Blair's Animal Corner calendars with the Hypno Frog on the cover. Head to twist.org, click on the Hypno Frog, and purchase your calendar today. I'll be mailing those out very soon as well. We really can't do any of this without you. And if you feel like the 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 buying things and uh supporting in the uh, in the financial way is something that is out of your ability at this point in time, please know that if you share us with other people, that is a, an amazing way that you can help us. Tell other people about Twist, help us grow our audience, help us grow our family of people who enjoy science together and love curiosity. That is a huge way to help as well. Thank you for your support. Can't do it without you. All right, Justin, do you have a story? You got something to talk yeah. about? 
Uh, this is Lancaster University researchers studying crystalline materials have discovered it has properties that allow it to capture energy from the sun. What? That can then be stored at room temperature for several months, then be released on demand in the form of heat. Uh, wait, wait. So it's like a sponge for the for very, sun. Exactly. And, exactly. It but is you fill very it up. A sponge. But then you fill it up, and it holds the the sunlight slash the water analogy. It just holds on to it until you need it. What at room temperature? What is this crazy material? Many months, and they're saying this could be used. Uh, uh, you could capture sunlight energy in the summer months, and then release it to create some warmth or heat. Um, it's you know in the winter or something like this. You could uh, in- ingrain it into windshields of cars, collect sun, and then you have that icy morning, and you could release that heat, and it could melt off the frost or all sorts of possibilities. Um, maybe even for energy, maybe for drug delivery, maybe for all mm. sorts of things. So uh, it's a really interesting. This is a material that's based on a. Metal Organic Framework, or MOF, M-O-F. This is a network of metal ions linked by carbon-based molecules. They form this sort of 3D structure. Uh, key pr- property of them is that they are porous, like a sponge, meaning they can, uh, they can form composite materials that host other smaller molecules within their structures. Uh, what's also interesting about these things is that they, with a chemical reactant uh the way that they're designed like lego pieces that can only go together one way you kind of take all of the components you put it in there you have a reaction chemical reaction uh initiation that takes place and everything assembles on a nano scale exactly as it's intended to like near 100% perfection uh they assemble themselves cuz there's really you know by design, only one way that they're able to attract and, and connect and, and stay linked together. So from a manufacturing process, it's really low effort it's, uh, to, to get mm-hmm. them to create these structures. Yeah. So uh, the Lancaster team, though, they set out to look at this uh, a composite that was previously prepared by a separate research team in Kyoto, Japan. Kyoto University in Japan, DMOF1, could be used to store energy, something that it had not been uh, tested for. So they took the MOF pores, the sponge, and they loaded it with molecules of uh, azobenzene, which by itself is an incredible uh, molecule. It's a crystalline molecule that can, that is photoreactive. So if you change the polarity of light, it can act like a switch. Uh, It can gather up and then be triggered to release its energy. Uh, It it absorbs light uh, amazingly well. Uh, It's it's considered a molecular machine just in the way. And it works in in UV light in in this experiment here. So in the test, researchers expose the material to UV light, which causes the azobenzene molecules to change shape to a strained configuration inside of this MOF, inside mm-hmm. of this, this sponge. So it stores energy uh, that become that stored energy is like potential energy, which is sort of like if you bend a spring and then there's that energy built up in that spring that's just waiting for you to release it so it can spring back. And then that energy is, is released. The, so these narrow pores of the moth sponge trap the azobenzene molecules in their strained position. And uh, in the research, it was at least four months. I guess that's probably how long they, they ran it for. It was at least four months they held the energy and then could be triggered uh, to switch states and release that energy as heat. So this uh, this is a... This is a really interesting effect that they found. Apparently, the overall energy ability to hold and release this was pretty modest. 
But this is also yeah. the first one that they've done this to. So there may be other photoreactives that are, have a greater potential uh, to hold larger amounts of energy. And yeah, this is the quote from Dr. John Griffin, who's the sen uh, senior lecturer in materials chemistry at Lancaster University and one of the investigators in the study, quoting, the material functions a bit like phase change materials, which are used to supply heat in hand warmers. However, while hand warmers need to be heated in order to recharge them, the nice thing about this material is it captures free energy directly from the sun, has no moving or electronic parts, and so there are no losses involved in the storage and release of the solar energy. Hope that with further development, we will be able to make other materials which store even more energy. That's so cool. I'm really just I'm so key questions for how useful this will be. I mean, it's this is the you know, mind blowing and mind boggling at the potential. If you know, is it going to is how much material can hold how much energy, how much energy can be released? Is it all the energy? How much energy is lost over time? How much it's does all, this material the cost? Energy. Yeah, but how much does this material cost? How expensive, how expensive will it be to produce? Is it something that they expect to um, make more efficient over time and, you know, to, to bring costs down? Is there, is there any way, uh, you know, is this something that will be broadly applicable at some point in time? That's really so, the question. Perhaps not the specific material, but other yeah. uh, applications for, for ma crystalline materials that do this photo switching, which may even be this material uh, yeah. at some point, uh, but wasn't looked so at. Cool. So you have a you have a you have a set defined arrangement of basically photoelectric switches mm -hmm. within a crystalline structure at a nano level. They can then be triggered or switched with a light source. Mm -hmm. So now we're talking data storage. Which we always end up with. Like, no matter what it is, it's like, oh, that could be used for data storage. Interesting. Uh, it is also has the ability then uh, to be implicated in drug delivery. So you... Because of the photo switch involved. Right. Exactly. It could be locked so, up and then released based hey, on light exposure. A lot of people exposure. made fun of Trump talking yeah. about if we put light inside yeah. of people. But... Um, but in this case, that you could deliver uh, a drug that's being held in the sponge anywhere in the body. Once it's accumulated, yeah. you could flash Tons a flashlight on it or yeah. of some sort and trigger it to do a release uh, right at the area in which it was targeted or only in the area in which it was targeted. So, yeah, uh, these moths, these are these are this. This is like Super the, exciting. This is the the sort next of, level. This is the, 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 it's not quite the nanotechnology that we were imagining a decade ago where these tiny robots were going to build and self assemble and do stuff for us. But yeah, it's the actual one that's come out of this so far, basically, uh, where you have self assembly by the pure fact that there's only one way to assemble and you smoosh it all together. And so it assembles this thing perfectly. Because mm -hmm. you've engineered it to assemble perfectly, like these little Lego blocks that can only fit in one way. And the uh, the applications are yeah. almost uh, are, are right now outpacing <laughs> the potential applications are outpacing the technology's ability. And whenever you see that, then you see investment, and then you see pursuing multiple directions of refinement of this technology so that you may get the drug delivery, the solar batteries, the self defrosting windshields, the new tinier computers or same yeah. size computers with much greater capacity that may actually be more reliable. All of these things come from breakthroughs in uh, materials and application technology that this, this MOF uh, or uh, metal organic uh, frameworks uh, is is seems to be leading us towards. So every time yeah, you think you're at the future, and <laughs> there's all, another step. And that, there's there's more. another future that comes <laughs> right in behind it and says, "Oh no, that was the future." I can see a new one on the horizon. 
Yeah. I, uh, with these, these frame, these metal organic frameworks, I just love the, the, the chemistry concept of using the empty space in molecules. Yeah. It's using the tension between the, the atoms in the molecule as you're talking about, but it's also taking advantage of the empty space that is inside of the molecule, putting other stuff in it. Like there's, it's just that concept itself is, is fantastic. I love it. Yeah. And if you go look up azobenzene, A-Z-O-B-E-N-Z-E-N-E, there's some fun uh, videos online of crystals that are just getting different polarities of light and the crystal is adjusting itself to the polarity of the light that is going (laughs) through it. Amazing. I mean, when you talk photoreactive, it is it is a non living thing, uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, reacting in in predictable ways. That's the important part. Reacting in a predictable way, alignment wise. Not a like light people. <laughs> well, it's predictable. Yeah, we're a little bit on that side too. Oh, and then uh, to end the stories. <clears throat> okay, so this is out of UC Davis Veterinary <laughs> School and other places. They did pathology reports on 50 killer whales, a little bit more than 50 uh, killer whales, over a decade. So it's a small sample size and a really long time, but we don't often get a lot of deceased killer whales that we can actually study. These are ones that have to get beached. We have to get there in time. We have to be able to diagnose how they even died. And what the study was looking at is like, uh, it's in the journal Plus One published uh, yesterday. I want to know what's killing killer whales. How do they die? What's what's happened here? And in m- pretty much most of the cases uh, that they could define, it was it was humans. Yeah. How? Yeah. What are we so, doing? So we we often think that we are affecting wildlife through noise pollution or pollution pollution toxins in the water, this sort of thing. It was everything from getting gouged by a hook for some other fishing purpose to uh, getting strikes by large seagoing vessels. Um, so there was actual direct killing, not just the sort of indirect stuff that was going on. That was that was the that was the one cause that seemed to go across age and health of individuals. There were some of the individuals that died because they were in poor health. Some that were just, you know, old and had accumulated a lot of health issues. But uh, the one thing that crossed through all age and health barriers, it was humans. (laughs) And so these are, this is, these are largely populations that we're attempting to preserve because we've also been attacking their food sources and the rest of it. But yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say is a lot of these interactions are probably related to that, that they they're um, ending up in the same place as vessels that are trying to collect fish. So that that creates conflict because either they're going to try to get that whale out of the way so that they don't lose any of their take, which is probably how a lot of those spears happen. Um, or they get hit by the boat because they're both following the same mm. school of fish. Yeah. Although I think these might be, uh, I, the impression I got that uh, though was that, and it, and it actually didn't specify. So I assumed it and you assumed it. My assumption that these is, was that these were somehow shipping vessels uh, cause I, uh, I'm trying to picture a smaller vessel being able to take out an orca. And I, eh. So, I mean, they're, they're big whales are big, right? Yeah. But <laughs> I think that also, um, there's fishing vessels that are really heavy and really kind of big. dense yeah. and yeah. And hardy. And, um, yeah, I, I don't think it's necessarily shipping vessels always. No, I think you're right. Uh, I was I, that was an assumption I made when I first read it. And one of the things actually that when we were talking about a while ago with that rogue orca uh, pod that was attacking boats, mm-hmm. turning them around and telling them to go home uh, earlier this year was was that uh, yeah some of the fishermen actually if they see orca will pursue them uh, to find tuna or, mm-hmm. or other uh, healthy uh, good fishing grounds 
Yeah. I mean, that's the problem is uh, a lot of uh, marine animals that we end up kind of infringing upon. It's because we're after the same resources. Yeah. I'm looking through pictures that I'm not going to share because it's just too sad of a lot of emaciated orcas that they uh, that they found that were part of their uh, their survey for this for this. And it's being asked uh, being asked in the chat room. But uh, so these weren't ones that were killed uh or sunk the, which is why it's such a small sample size over this time these are ones that were they found beached yeah so they had to i mean it's they a, found them dead it's not a great sample size for any form of a study it's like hey let's uh, just study the things that happen to show up on our front porch well, it's doing a roadkill so study good. right yeah yeah let's which study, you know is a really good way to figure roadkill. out yeah. why animals die on the road not yeah. just why animals die in it general, which is car. why this is like, you know, exactly. This is why killer whales die and then get beached. Yeah. It's yeah. not why killer it's animal killer awesome. whales die overall. Which was why I kept trying to replace it with the stories that Kiki has uh, <laughs> coming up, because those were really good stories. They are. This is a this is a good story. It's a sad story. There's a lot that we can oh, no. do to uh, influence our... Uh, interaction with with the other animals on this planet right Mm -hmm. more positively we got to share share a little bit humans humans but yes i do have three stories that i want to talk about before the end of the show and blair the first one Mm -hmm. has to do with telomeres yes give me those telomeres let me are you sure give me so many aglets i just want all of the aglets all are you you sure are you, you think, sure? You Careful think, what you ask for. Right. You think you want those little shoelace ends. You think you want those telomeres at the capping the ends of your of your chromosomes. Well, according to this new study out of Rockefeller University, telomerase and telomeres are very likely involved in your likelihood of getting cancer. This study... No. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it involved with the researchers in Radboud University Medical Center in Holland, where they have identified Dutch families that are severely cancer-prone. And these families have mutations in a, a gene called Tin F2. And this gene encodes the Tin2 protein that is part of controlling telomere length. And so they pulled uh, a researcher from Rockefeller into this study to look into what was going on with Tin2 and telomeres. A postdoctoral fellow, fellow Isabel Schmutz, used CRISPR as a tool to engineer cells so that they have the exact same mutations as the cells that are seen in the Dutch families. So they had these mutated TIN2 proteins. Their telomeres were doing great, super functional, no genomic instability, but the telomeres got too long, which is part of what was going on in these Dutch families. Blair's looking at you right now like, can it see the man be too long? I didn't yeah, think that I didn't was possible. Think that it could be. And indeed, that is what this study says. Long telomeres. Lo- the longer your telomeres are, the higher your chances of getting cancer. And the reason for this is that the uh the telomeres limit the number of times that your cells divide. Every time mm-hmm. your cells divide, the te- telomeres shorten. And if your telomeres are long, that allows for potentially more divisions and more time for mutations to occur. Right, and if right, mutations occur in cancer-promoting regions, then you are more likely to get cancer. So there's a balancing point between maintaining our telomeres. Yeah. So maintain. But, don't lengthen. But, don't lengthen, but... We want to really be careful about uh so what this what this gets down to at the at the the real basic level is that our stem cells have the telomerase that allows the re 
the refreshing of the telomeres. It keeps adding to the length of the telomeres so that the stem cells can divide pretty much indefinitely and they can uh, they can divide into different cell types and they're like, well, I'm going to be anything. And our adult cells, the the cells that have differentiated, don't have this. They don't have that ability. They have a very limited division potential. And so how do we get the cells to stay healthier longer and not necessarily divide too early so that you end up, you know, you don't want to end up being 70 years old, but you're going to live to 150, 200 years old, but you're on your last cells. They can't divide anymore because they're out of tel telomerase. But if you were lengthening it, then you might get more cancer. So, I mean, there's this balance that needs to be struck. Somewhere. Yeah, it seems it seems maintenance, not uh not augmentation right yeah. that's what you need is you need to make sure that your telomeres don't get shorter you just longer is not the answer just keep them and what did we what did we learn about uh <laughs> telomeres yeah. in space they get longer in space mm -hmm. and then they get shorter when you come back to earth so again weird things What's oh that? boy we got a secret mission into the neutral zone Okay, uh, warp eight. Uh, what's that? Oh, I gotta get another colonoscopy? Oh, all right, I'll be right back. <laughs> like, yeah, like space, you're gonna have to be totally vigilant and treating cancer all the time because you're, you're gonna have longer telomeres. Longer telomeres. Moving away from telomeres and refreshing the telomeres, let's talk about refreshing our our biology like just refreshing the cells mm -hmm. re refreshing our eyes like oh well, that would be good <sighs> starting over you're getting glaucoma pressure increases in your eyes you're starting to get the, get the get get glaucoma oh my gosh can we just go back to a younger eye state yes please mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, please. Well, yeah. researchers publishing today in Nature suggest that it's possible. And what they are doing is uh, research based on previous research out of La Jolla, California, the Salk Institute done by Juan Carlos Is Ispizua Belmonte, uh, who has been looking into the epigenome and changing the epigenome. As I mentioned earlier with the talking about that plant memory study about wiping the, epige the epigenetic markers from the genome, as you age, your epigenome changes. You start out with your, your basic epigenome, your DNA is wrapped up in a certain way based on the histones and the methylization. And that's just the way it is when you're younger, but then based on experiences during your life, stress, environment, all sorts of things, the epigenome changes and it there are more twists and turns and it kind of gets mucked up. And they think that part of this building and adding of epigenetic markers leads to some parts of aging and our cells getting older and things just not working quite as well. And so this question is, can you reset the epigenome? 2016, Belmonte uh, showed that there were four genes in mice that could revert skin cells back to a stem cell-like state. They could they could do that, um, but there was a problem with the potential of using these uh, the using these genes for too long. They had to be used for just the right amount of time, or they would cause cancer. And you don't want to cause cancer. It's like go go be stem cell like, or go be young again, but it, don't be too young. Don't start dividing all over the place and give me a tumor. And so, the researchers uh, now that are published for every time I heard that growing up. <laughs> <laughs> don't so be a research, tumor. Don't be a tumor. <laughs> don't do that. Uh, these researchers publishing in Nature today, they looked at the eye's retinal nerves and they tested the approach using three of those four genes that were used by Ispazua Belmonte. Um, and in this study, the one they got rid of was one of the ones that triggers cancer more often. So that was probably a good call on that front. These genes are, they're SOX genes, HOX and SOX, and uh, they're a, a little cocktail of genes that are involved in 
developmental aspects of cell uh, cell metabolism and and functioning and they pretty much showed in this study that they were able to take from mice old retinal cells and regenerate them they improved visual acuity in mice with age related vision loss they uh, they also reset epigenetic patterns to a more youthful state in mice and also in human cells in the laboratory. But to, so far, really what we're looking at is in mice. They're, they're resetting mice. So we are doing such a good job at making mice younger. Curing everything that uh, has ever befallen mice. <laughs> we, uh... Yeah, interesting to note, though, six out of five ophthalmologists are against this drug. Hmm, I wonder why that would be. Hmm? No. You're making that up, but still, it's going to put some 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 jobs on the line. And right in line with this study, I was the, the, these two studies were like right next to each other, and I couldn't, I can't believe that all this aging research is coming out all at once. So we've got this team, the the Salk team, and um, and this team publishing in Nature. They're publishing on their epigenome efforts to reverse aging. And now also a UC San Francisco team looking at stress response in uh, in cells is also trying to reduce uh, reverse aging. And they're using a drug called ISRIB. And this ISRIB, it stands for Integrated Stress Response Inhibitor. The uh, integrated stress response is in the cells. Stress happens and your cells respond to it. And it's the response is not usually great. And over time, the effects of stress build up in our cells and lead to gene mutations, all sorts of problems. Protein synthesis slows down. Things don't work as well. Cells start behaving poorly. And suddenly you have issues like dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So they have been using this drug, ISRIB, the inhibitor to the stress response. And in this study, they showed in mice that they were able to inject the ISR inhibitor and reset the mental functioning of mice to an, a, an earlier state. Do you I, think this takes away for the, the uh, test, human yeah. test? Yeah. No, do you, I'm, do you... I'm ready. I'm ready now now right yeah do you think this takes away the sensation of stress or do you think it only takes away no 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 the effects of the stress. effects of stress so yes, that's the you know cellular yeah right so this is definitely also sign me up but <laughs> i just kind of wanted to clarify that because i do think that you know there's a there's a feedback loop i will also admit though that there's a physical there's a physiological response to stress that can trigger more stress <laughs> So right. I do also think that there would be potential benefits on feeling stress emotionally. Oh, of course. This doesn't based stop. On this. Yeah. No. Yeah. This does not. This is not the, the emotional stress response. This has nothing to do with that. This is right. internal cell cascade in the physiological metabolic right. stress in that the cells are experiencing. Um, it would be you know, something like um, oxidation stress or um, even, you know, oxygen, uh, a lack of oxygen or, you know, a change in pH or little factors that could be considered as stress mm -hmm. to a cell. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I get that that would build up to organismal level stress yeah. as well. But what they're, what, what this is suggesting is that over time, the functioning of this system, while it is great in the moment for helping cells survive stress, over time it leads to the buildup of side effects that are detrimental, and that are detr detrimental if you're if you're considering in the brain, then detrimental to cognitive functioning. Um, and so they they did small doses of this drug in uh, in older mice tested them on cognitive tasks against youth, youthful mice, and they found that uh, the older mice performed as well as the younger mice once they had been uh, been given this drug. And it's not a drug that has to be given 
continually over time. It appears from the study to have uh, from a short period wow. of application of the drug that the the effects are long lasting. So it so resets. Combine to, that with it the... resets to an earlier state, so the stress response can build up again. <laughs> so combine that with the blood transfusion, uh, right? Evidence give in me, the past. Give me reset my epigenome. I want the young young people blood. I want the yeah. ISRIB. Young microbiome. Too. Yes, yeah. young microbiome transplant. There we go. I, I don't know about the age defined <laughs> definitions of the microbiome. I don't know that. I don't. I, I feel like my microbiome is stronger now, or as strong. Well, now. I mean, we've definitely reported on studies where they did um, a microbiome transplant from young mice to old mice. But so far, so far, all of these studies, while sounding so exciting and promising, are on mice. The exciting aspect of this is that both of the studies that I just talked about, uh, the epigenetic reset and the stress response reset, both of them already have companies that are translating this basic research out of the research labs and into potential therapeutics. So both of these are already on their way into human application. It's going to be Sign a long road, client clinical I'll, studies, I'll all pick. that. This is the kind of, it, it, they're looking at ISRIB to help with traumatic brain injury. The researchers say it didn't just make up for some of the cognitive deficits in mice with traumatic brain injury. It erased them. They've never seen anything like this before. They saw uh, they saw issues related to these injuries disappear overnight. Uh, so they're thinking that repetitive mild brain injury, like concussion accidents that ISRIB could help with that. Uh, additionally, it could help for uh, treat Alzheimer's and dementia. It could there. There's a whole bunch of application for a drug like this uh, in the market and especially in an aging population. And in a population that enjoys its contact sports. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just, it's both of it. It's it's very exciting. All right. Those are my stories. We have one question to end the show. This Week in Science Questions, we have a question today. Hi, Twisters. I have a few related questions <clears throat> about human immune systems. With so much attention on the COVID-19 vaccine race, I was wondering if we know how many viruses humans collectively are immune to globally, and two, if there is theorized to be a limit in order of magnitude of the number of viruses the immune system can protect us from, or does it appear limitless? We have access to many vaccines and an annual flu vaccine, so we can gain immunity to each new strain as influenza virus mutates. Three, is there a theory as why the immune system may retain a long-term memory for some viruses, but not others? Thanks, Emma Moulton. Can I try real quick? You can try real quick. I've got some answers. But no, I no, and yes. <laughs> All right. I like your answers. Okay. That's good. <laughs> very, very simple answers. I like it. Straightforward. Cut, cut to the chase. All right. So I did a little, a little digging and found that according to a 2012 paper, uh, there are 200, or at least in 2012, probably more now, but in 2012, there were 219 known virus species that infect humans. Only 212 known, but other estimates. Low. Yeah, mm -hmm. it does sound low, right? But when yeah. you're talking about what we know, that means what we can isolate, what we can identify, what we can, you know, really track down to being a virus. This that's that in itself is challenging, and so has the work been done to do that? Other estimates suggest that there are as many magnitude that there are many magnitudes more from 320,000 viruses this is based on looking at uh at mammal studies uh to more than 3 million viruses that affect mammals generally and then if you go out broadly to vertebrates and other organisms you're going to it just viruses are there's so many viruses so 
The good news is it's also estimated that the human body can produce 10 billion antibodies. So if we're only going against that 219 known viruses, we're doing great. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, we can we yeah. can do a great job of producing antibodies. Yeah, but that's it isn't that also it's us, yeah. its own numbers game. Like we've produced antibodies, but not enough of them. Or not we've right. produced Are antibodies th- and we beat this one, and now they're all being used because we can't now we can't fight this other thing. Or like it beca- is a little Or we bit have of ten a- billion, but they're just not still not the right antibody right. and mm-hmm. that doesn't match right mm-hmm. <laughs> for instance SARS-CoV-2 if you haven't been infected by a coronavirus before if you you know this is a novel virus the spike protein is something that's fairly new to human immune systems and so some people may have better immunity because for whatever reason they already have an antibody that matches up to that mm-hmm. really well but a lot of us don't. Most of us don't. But the great thing is that we ha- can gain immunity and the adaptive immune system is amazing for that. And so we really, we just need a little experience with a virus to be able to become immune to them. Usually, hopefully we can gain that immunity uh, without dying in the process. <laughs> That's, That's a really clever thing about our immune system is that it's not, yeah. uh, it's not preloaded pre-programmed like virus software might be to look for right, right? To think of it as i uh, i didn't mean it to be virus to virus but for a software virus uh screener or whatever it's looking for specific viruses only if a new novel one comes along it will never fix it it will miss it completely mm-hmm. and entirely because it's not programmed to look at that yeah the human immune system actually is looking to learn from the next invader and then create a response to it so that it kind of almost doesn't matter what it is. It should be able to have at least a very good fighting chance to defeat yeah. it, no matter if there's 219 or 320 million or whatever the the upper number was of this uh, potentiality of, of viruses to encounter. And then, yeah, what you were saying is, like, if you have one that was, maybe it is a completely novel virus that has entered the system, but if it has the same spike protein as uh, 300 others that have come and gone, you you should be able to beat You're it, even be though it's otherwise yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I it's, mean, the, it's uh, a probability game. The other thing that that's kind of cool about it is that viruses need us to be able to reproduce right this mm-hmm. makes them a virus and so um that you know i think about viruses the way i think about parasites a good parasite doesn't kill oh, its host yeah so <laughs> viruses in order to be good at what they do shouldn't kill you quickly and that gives your body time to develop slowly antibodies exactly it gives you time well, it shouldn't kill you at all exactly which is why this this virus probably does not harm bats at all right like or with the origin uh mutation at least if this isn't the same doesn't harm bats in any way they're symbiotic it may, it may even have some weird uh unbeknownst beneficial niche within bat society uh that we could we could find out we at don't some know point. about yeah yeah uh but <laughs> but the problem is we're not the right host. We're the current vector that we're concerned about because we're us and that's all we care about. But we're not the intended host. What we have isn't an intended effect of this virus to destroy the host. Because uh, that is, like you say, completely an antithesis of what it wants to do. However, yeah. we are doing an exceptional job of one of the stages, which is the replication and spreading. Of it, so that aspect, its its reproductive cycle is doing phenomenally well, even if it eventually runs out of us uh, through yeah. killing us or through uh, resistance. And then that comes down to the last question, which is 
terrible example. To do with long-term memory. So it seems like we need to get booster shots for our vaccines. We need to, uh, our immune system seems to get tired of remembering things over time. And why is that? Well, I mean, everything. On to the next one. Yeah. So, I mean, that comes down to a couple of different different things that work together to affect immunity over time. And we have viral mutations, so the viruses can mutate slightly. And so you might need a slightly different vaccine. That booster may have a slightly different uh, antigen makeup than a previous shot. Um, And your immune system gets older. And as your immune system gets older, the old the old stuff that's gone unused for a really long time does sometimes go out with the trash. Sometimes, you know, those B cells that are the memory B cells, T cells that are in there and supposed to be holding on to these these antibody memories for us. I mean, if if if, if you haven't come across something for a very, 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 very long time, your body's going to think that it doesn't need it anymore. And in, the, in biology, it is definitely a mantra. Use it or lose it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, so having, having over time, your your also your, your immune system just gets older and um, older immune systems don't create as much antibody. They don't, they are not doing, they're not creating large, healthy cells. They're, they're creating little weaker cells eh, that can't do as much. So you have mutations, you have time. Lots of things go into that, but uh, yeah, yeah. Over time, over time, the body does kind of go. I don't need that anymore. Maybe I don't think there is a single vaccine that we have that is supposed to last for life. Right. Like, well, the reason, yeah. So the reason that, for example, we don't need polio vaccines anymore is because people got them for long enough that it went extinct, essentially. So it's it's not that the vaccine worked forever. It's that it worked for long enough that it couldn't find a host. no more hosts. And so it died. Yeah. Yeah. And so nobody has to get polio vaccines anymore, which yeah. is great. Yeah. And Thank so that's, goodness. I think, yeah, that's the thing about the the whole, the vac- vaccination and, and all these kinds of things is eventually you want to just not need the antibodies anymore because it doesn't mm-hmm. exist anymore. And wouldn't that be great? Yeah, mm-hmm. it, would it would. Be great. It would. Thank you so much for your question, Emma. So great to hear from you. If anyone else wants to ask a question, send them my way. Send me an email, Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, or you can leave a note over on Facebook. Leave a message over there on our This Week in Science page. All right. I think we've done it. I think we have come to the end of the show. Have we done it? We've done it. We've done it. We've done it. Yeah, we've done it. We've done it. Yes, we have. Thank you all for joining us for another episode. Thank you so much. I want to give the shout outs. Thank you to Fada for your help with social media and show notes. Gord, thank you for manning the chat room. And Identity4, thank you for recording the show. I'd also like to thank our Patreon sponsors and the Burroughs Welcome Fund for their generous support. Thank you to Woody MS, Andre Basset, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vegard Shefstad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Scioli, Guillaume, John Lee, Gorov Sharma, Shu Bru, Sarah Forfar, Darwin Handen, Donald Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Bentley, the translator, Big Nell, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Joshua Fury, Sean and Nina Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessen, Flo, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Richard, Brendan Minish, Melisande, Johnny Gridley, Kevin Railsback, Flying Out, Richard Porter, Christopher Dreyer, Mark Mazaros, Artyom, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Conrad Michaels is a Russian super spy, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Matt Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapeau, Sarah Chavis, Alex Wilson, John Ratnaswamy, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, and Aerith Luthen. Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Stanton, Paul Disney, Patrick Pecoraro, Ben Rothegg, Gary S., Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Condren, Jason Roberts, and Dave Friedel. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. If you would like to support us on Patreon, head to twist.org and click on the Patreon link. On next week's show, 
We will be back Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific Time broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Sure. It's, I mean, you might want to hear the more okay. polished version of the show. I, I think it's fun to hear the other stuff. But anyway, if you do want to listen to us as a podcast, you can search for This Week in Science Server Podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, you can also get your friends to subscribe as well. That'd be great. <laughs> we love we love your friends, even though we've not met them yet. Uh, for more information on anything you've heard here today, there will be show notes, links to the stories themselves. So if you're like, ah! I really want to read more about that. You can just go to our website, www.twist.org. You can also sign up for a newsletter that will give you information in your email hole. And you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at science.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered all the way into a super chilled uh, portable freezer next to vaccine doses. Yes. Nice. Nice. Awesome. That's actually a good place to put a spam email. Uh, you can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science with one S in the middle. At Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This Week in Science. This Week in Science. This Week in Science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world. And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our method instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. Got the eye. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, 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 science. science. Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way you better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science 
This week in science. 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 This week in science.